Hello, this is Reed Armstrong once again from Artistic Lecturer for the International Catholic University. Our subject is the sacred in art. Uh, we have done previously, this is our, our fourth lecture, we've done previously the Greek concept of cosmos and the ordering of the universe according to human reason. We've done Christianity East and West. Uh, we've done our le third lecture was symbolism, universal symbolism, to help give us an understanding of the uh, imaginative language used in a great many works of art. We've done medieval art, lecture number four, which brought us from monasticism up through the rise of the cathedrals in France. Today we're going to move on to Italy, and the title of the topic would be The Franciscan Spirit and Its Influence on Art. We have seen that there was a spirit in France which moved ahead, and there was a spirit that moved alongside somewhat distinctly in Italy, and it was largely due to, as we shall see, uh, St. Francis. Now I'm going to have a brief introduction here which I'm going to read, then I will go to the monitor and uh, show some slides to point out how this actually works in the visual arts. All right, having tri traced the rise of the cathedral cities and palaces of the Heavenly Queen in northern France, culminating in the uh, end years of the 13th century, we ought to step back for a moment to the beginning of that century to look at a phenomenon that profound effects on the visual arts and the Catholic outlook on life in general. I'm referring, of course, to the mendicant orders founded by St. Dominic and St. Francis. Although Dominic was a Spaniard and Francis was an Italian and their approach to religion was most distinct, we somehow linked the two of them together. Between the two of them, they profoundly changed the way <coughs> the Catholic Christianity would face the future. Dominic is, of course, a preacher who proclaimed orthodoxy and fidelity to the Roman See. Unflinchingly, Francis was fundamentally a poet who forged a new Christian imagination. The reason that these two uh, saints are so intimately linked together, I believe, is not just that they were virtual contemporaries or even that they actually did meet. I believe that they form the two intrinsic components of human nature, that is, reason and imagination. Both are necessary for an integrated existence, even at the supernatural level. Wolfgang von Goethe in the 19th century stated the case this way, philosophy directs itself to the riddles of reason and attempts to solve them by means of the word. Poetry points at the riddles of nature and tries to resolve them by means of the image. And the entire thrust of these series of lectures is we put the two together, that they both are necessary and that the arts have been and will continue to be an integral part of our Catholic heritage and formation. Both Dominic and Francis were uh, necessary to perform then a complete revolution. The sons of Dominic, specifically St. Thomas, accepted Aristotelian philosophy and defended the natural order as fundamentally good. Francis and his so sons sang its praises with vivid imagination. We've already seen the effects of Thomistic philosophy in the stone and glass of the cathedrals in France, the poor man's summas, as it were, and we shall now be looking at the work of one of the greatest painters of sacred themes of all times in our next lecture, that is the Dominican Fra Angelico, where we will look at a man that was both a beatified uh, saint, beatified first step I mean, of the church, and also a world-class artist, but that's our next lecture. Now we're going, to go, we're going to stick with St. Francis. Fortunately, as one of the most venerated saints of all times, there's no shortage of biographies of his life. There's that of his contemporary, Thomas of Celano, which is worth quoting. Oh, how beautiful, how splendid, how glorious did he appear in the innocence of his life, in the simplicity of his words, in the purity of his heart, in his love of God, in his fraternal charity, in his ardent obedience, in his peaceful submission, in his angelic countenance. He was charming in his manners, serene by nature, affable in his conversation, most opportune in his exhortations, most faithful in what was entrusted to him, 
cautious in counsel, effective in business, gracious in all things. He, Celano continues, was quick to pardon, slow to become angry, ready of wit, tenacious of memory, unbending with himself, understanding towards other, and discreet in all things. I mean, the paean goes on and on. Suffice it, the poor man of Assisi, il poverello, made quite an impression on his time. Uh, the fact that Pope Gregory IX canonized him only two years after his death, and that Dante, his contem uh, came a hundred years later, sang his praises in the Paraiso, certainly a testament I mean, to the uh, esteem in which he was held. Saint Bonaventure, the seraphic doctor of the Franciscan order, wrote his official biography, and it is from this that we shall see some of the glorious paintings of the events from the saint's life in the upper church at Assisi. Many modern writers have attempted to elucidate on the Franciscan spirit, but the one whose words will help understand the saint's role as an inspiration to the arts, perhaps best is G.K. Chesterton, who himself being a man of imagination and paradox, could best understand how in one man could be combined the spirit of severe asceticism and a poetic enthusiasm for the splendors of nature. For Chesterton, Francis was the quintessential troubadour, a man of natural vivacity and courtesy who preached a fresh start after the rigors of medieval penance for the abomination of paganism. All that St. Benedict had stored up, Francis took and scattered. And that Francis' personal asceticism and love of penance was his way of ever throwing things into the bottomless pit of fathomless thanks. A wonderfully poetic way of putting it. Now, St. Francis was not a nature lover or a pantheist as he's often presented to the modern world, a kind of proto-New Ager, but a saint and a realist who loved his creator above all else and saw his reflection in the seemingly infinite splendor and variety of creation. He did not again, in the words of Chesterton, call nature his mother. He called a particular donkey his brother or a particular sparrow his sister. He did not love humanity as modern-day philanthropists, but is like our Lord and Savior, who loved each and every human being. His exquisite canticle of brother son is not like that of the heretic Dominican Tommaso Campanella, a prayer to Phoebus, the sole invictus of pagan Rome, but a hymn of praise to that same God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob that the inspired Israelite children in the fiery furnace sang. All you works of the Lord, praise the Lord. Francis, after crying out that all praise is yours, most high God, goes on to sing, Laudate si, min monsignori, con tutti le tue creaturi, specialmente messori lo frate sole, kind of Italian-Latin mixture. All praise to you, Lord, through all that you have made. First off, my Lord brother's son. The Franciscan miracle, if you will, was to bring back Christmas which he literally did by organizing the life-size nativity scenes, uh, complete with living animals, as we'll see depicted in the murals of the Assisi Church. St. Francis in no way denied the suffering of Christ. It was, after all, a talking crucifix that started out on his mission. Francis simply had a vision that the road to heaven started here on earth. Just as St. Dominic destroyed the world-hating Manichaeans with his preaching, St. Francis did it with a song. This is not to say that Francis the poet, though he was, ever fell into any kind of an antinomian trap of pietism. Many today see Francis as a visionary whose faith lay beyond the confines of strict church doctrine, a kind of, again, proto-New Ager or ecumenist beyond the Roman Catholic tradition. We must remember, first and foremost, that Francis was a Roman Catholic. The following taken from his admonition on the body of Christ, the Eucharist, certainly proclaims the orthodoxy of Franciscan devotion, key to Franciscan devotion today. Lord Jesus says, the Lord Jesus says to his disciples, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Therefore, all those who see the Lord Jesus according to his humanity and did not see and believe according to the Spirit and the Godhead that he is the true Son of God were condemned. And now, in the same way, all those who see the sacrament of the body of Christ, which is sanctified by the words of the Lord upon the altar at the hands of the priest, in the form of the bread and wine, 
and who does not see and believe according to the Spirit and the Godhead that this is truly the most holy body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ are condemned. These are hard words indeed, as are those he gave in an admonition on obedience. And should the subject, friar, sometimes see that some things might be better and more useful for his soul than what the prelate, a Franciscan word for superior, may command him, let him willingly offer such things to God as a sacrifice and instead, of earn, instead earnestly try to fulfill the wishes of the prelate. For this is loving obedience because it pleases God and neighbor. Now, having sketched in briefly the nature of this incredibly complex phenomenon called St. Francis of Assisi, uh, we're going to look at the world he lived and moved in and the art that I believe his movement inspired. We know that it inspired. And we're going to move on to the slides. To begin, we're going to go to the world in which St. Francis lived and the artwork which he would have seen. Now, this piece we have here on the screen is by uh, Cimabue, the teacher of Giotto. And it is in the Stilo Greco, as they called it, the Greek style, which we saw in the Byzantine art in our study of Christian art East and West. This was the reigning art in Italy at the time, in the Trecento, the 1300s. This was done slightly after Francis's death, but, I mean, it is in the style of art which he would have seen. It is the golden background representing heaven, the heavenly world. The, the, these icons are visions into eternity. Here we have Christ as the Pantocrator, or the wisdom of God, teaching. He wears the red robes here of his sacrifice, his bloody sacrifice. He carries the book, Egerson Lux Mundi, I am the light of the world. Uh, he has the Byzantine Christos formed with his hands. He is the Christ. He is the anointed one. And he is flanked by Peter and James. A complete Italianate copy of Byzantine art. Remember that Rome had fallen. And we saw that uh, there was chaos in the Western world in France, even parts of Italy, great parts of Italy. And whereas there was no civilization in France until Charlemagne uh, reestablished in the year 800, Christmas Eve, with the crowning of the Pope, a Christian empire, uh, Italy still remained under the artistic influence of Constantinople, the Byzantine Empire. This Byzantine Empire didn't collapse until 1453, uh, when it was attacked by the Turks. So this is the kind of artwork of what we call the Greek style. Next, please. Uh, this is, um, by Paisano, is called the Romanesque style, the, what we saw in, in France. This is more of a Western style of art from the 11th and 12th century. This is the type of crucifix in the churches uh, when St. Francis was born. This again was done slightly after uh, St. Francis' time, but I just chose two artists that ex exemplify this style who happened to be great artists. Uh, you have the Blessed Mother and St. John, on either side, again, iconographically correct, which we studied in our uh, lesson on iconography, that the Blessed Mother becomes to the stage right. Remember, the Christ is in the center looking out. Whenever we look at a picture, uh, it is a person, it is a scene going on in the picture that Christ is looking out so that the Blessed Mother, although she is on your left looking at it, she is on Christ's right hand, as it was at the cross. I mean, what, Son, behold your mother, mother, behold your son. This is the way it was, this is the way, and it is totally symbolically correct. Symbolism is not it's something invented by man. It is an order imposed by God onto creation so that we know and love him more. Uh, so we have the Romanesque and the Greek style, both of which would have been the predominant art styles uh, that, that would have influenced Francis as he was growing up. Next, please. Even the earliest portrait of St. Francis, uh, done in uh, 13, I mean 1235, uh, nine years after the saint's death, is done in the Stilo Greco, the Greek style. The saint is placed in heaven. It's the ha these are scenes from his life around him, very stylistic. And it shows the saint probably looks prob somewhat like him. 
We don't know exactly, there were no photographs back then, and, there, and no painting was done actually during his lifetime, but probably the tradition was still enough alive that this is what the saint looked like in a stylized fashion. But what he would have, again, in the iconographic sense, he will hold his hand to show the mark of the stigmata, that this is, this is his uh, identification with Christ. He's placed in the center of a golden scene because of this identification with Christ and he holds the book in his hand. It's very similar, as we saw uh, almost to the Pantocrator, instead of having the, the Christos, I mean, that uh, we saw before of the Christ ho uh, holding up his hand to show who he is. Here we have St. Francis in the center of an icon showing his identification with Christ. I mean, many authors I mean, will hold, I mean, this was that St. Francis was, in many ways, a new Christ to a new generation. Next, please. Now, this, of course, is the uh, crucifix that spoke to uh, St. Francis in St. Damien's church, saying, rebuild my church, which is falling into ruin. It's an anonymous uh, Romanesque crucifix. It's iconographically, iconographically correct, of course, because it has the Blessed Mother and St. John, the male and the female, all lined up in proper perspective. It's not a what we call a museum uh, quality crucifix, eh, well it is today of course because it spoke to St. Francis, I mean we all, so many of us have copies of this crucifix, but I mean it's not a signed work of art and it's I think indicative of the way that God works that he doesn't normally use the great to do his work, he chooses the humble, even in artwork, he chooses the weak to confound the strong. And in this case, he uses an anonymous, very beautiful, very lovely crucifix to work his miracle on St. Francis. I mean, he chooses, I say, the weak, and then his work is made more powerful. So it's not the, anything done by man. If it were a great work of art, you'd think oh, it was the great artwork that converted St. Francis. No, it's a lovely, simple work of art, but it is God who is speaking through it. Next, please. Now the surroundings, this is Assisi, of course, and I was in Assisi this past summer, and I recommend the pilgrimage to all who have never made it. It is a beautiful city, and is much the same as it was at the time of Francis. So if we look at the surrounding countryside, the olive groves, the vineyards, and one walks through these fields, one walks through the same world in which St. Francis walked uh, back in the 1300s, or 12, the 13th century, 1226 he died. The only thing that's changed so very much in this, of course, is the great basilica at the end, which was uh, edific, uh, edif over his tomb. So that was not there. But the rest of the town, this was the, uh, called the Inferno, the Infernal Hill, uh, where, where um, criminals were executed. And it's strange, this wonderful sort of paradox that God works. That everything is sanctified. The, the criminal hill is sanctified by Francis being buried there. So that part is new. But this is the world Francis knew. Next, please. I have the next slide. All right, this is the room where St. Francis was born. It was changed into, it was made into a shrine within 25 years after his death. The, the legend, what we call it the legend, the history, St. Bonaventure's history of the saint, uh, says that uh, Francis' mother, Pica, had a dream in which she was told to go down to this room under the house, which was a stable, so that Francis, again, in this analogy to Christ, might be born in a, in a, in a stable. I, I'm not saying this is true or not. I mean, if it's in, the, it's, it's in the book, why not? I mean, it certainly it would be fitting. So this was the stable under the, uh, the Bernardoni house where St. Francis was born and is a shrine today. All of Assisi is made up of these shrines to the saint. Next, please. Um, here we have the Portuncula. Now this is the little tiny church uh, where St. Francis and his friends gathered. This is down in the valley from Assisi, which we saw. The scene we saw of Assisi right before was taken from down by the Portuncula. This church is, I say, tiny. It was a pilgrimage site even in the time of St. Francis and still is a site of pilgrimage to, uh, to this day. I mean, it's an indulgence site uh, where you may go. The paintings that are on the wall back there were not there at the time of St. Francis. They were there 13th century, 
and it's an Annunciation, which follows the, the rules of iconography perfectly with the angel stage left and the Blessed Mother stage left, the angel bringing the word of God, uh, and Mary receiving in the name of all humanity the incarnation, the fusion of God and nature in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I say, this little shrine is enclosed by an enormous church, which is in not very good taste, it's sort of a neoclassic something or other, uh, but this church, not only the outer church, contains this little tiny church, the portiuncle, the little, the little piece that uh, Francis asked for and was given by the, the Dominicans, uh, at, or I mean the Benedictines, <laughs> excuse me, uh, at that time. Um, the rest of Francis' life was lived in such a close vicinity, by and large, to this little church, that where he slept, where he ate, where he preached, everything is enclosed in this enormous complex, which is the basilica down in the lower valley of Assisi. Francis was buried right next to the church, and on the stage right, if we're looking at it on the left, as you're looking over here to the left, right next to it, it was his favorite place, because it was tiny and intimate and it, 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 on the ground. He died on the ground next to his beloved church. Next, please. Now, the center of any Franciscan pilgrimage is the tomb of the saint himself, uh, which is exquisite. This was he was buried in obscurity. He was brought from the Portuncola up to the Col d'Inferno, and his, the site of his burial was unknown up until 1818, where it was rediscovered, and this uh, shrine was built below the lower basilica. And as a slight digression here, um, some of our non-Catholic brothers have take offense at our uh, veneration of the saints and these pilgrimage sites going to the tomb where this saint is buried. Now, the Catholic conception is, as a saint, a person who has died in Christ, especially someone such as St. Francis, who was canonized within two years, I mean, the similarity to Christ, his incorporation into the mystical body makes him alive. Even though his bones are buried here, they are live bones. Now, the theology of this was clearly stated by St. John Chrysostom, who was Bishop of Constantinople at the same time of Ambrose and Augustine in the, in the West, in the 4th century, uh, <coughs> late 4th century, beginning of 5th century, in his story, The Blessed Babylas, where there, uh, Bab who was a bishop of, of Rome, uh, well, uh, the Roman uh, see, I mean, he wasn't the Pope, a uh, Western bishop, who confronted the emperor, we don't know which emperor, the Basilea, the, and uh, told him he was a dreadful sinner because he had killed the son of uh, one of his adversaries as he held as a hostage, and this was a breach of trust, and he was thrown out. The blessed Babylas threw the emperor out of church. Now, the emperor obviously, I mean, was didn't take that lying down and had, the, had Babylas killed. And they buried Babylas's bones in a pagan site of a temple to Apollo, one of these, like the Delphi we saw in Greece, one of these pythonesses or pythons spoke, a, a demon uh, was giving oracles to, to the pagan populace. And the demon himself, according to St. John Chrysostom, said, I can no longer give prophecies because of the bones that have been laid here. These saintly bones have stopped my prophecies. So this is part of the, the early theology of the bones of the saints having power. So when we go to venerate the tomb of St. Francis, we're venerating not dry, dead bones, but these are the bones of a saint that are living in Christ. And we can go there and p make our petition to the saint as we are making it to Christ through one of his predilect members of his mystical body. Next, please. This is the lower church uh, at Assisi. And some of the greatest painters, I mean, of Christendom, I mean, uh, Giotto, Simon Martini, Lorenzetti, I mean, uh, Cimabue, all of these painters, I mean, of the, the big names in the art books have dedicated their uh, talent and their artistry to decorating this lower church, which is the tomb church, the crypt church. And this is, I mean, in the Catholic tradition of giving the best we absolutely have artistically to this concept of veneration of the saint. It's not art for art's sake. This is art dedicated to God through the veneration of a saint 
at the site of his tomb. Next, please. Now, one of the keys, as I said in the introduction, uh, to Franciscan spirituality is the nativity of bringing the heavenly realm down to earth, of singing the praises of creation as giving creation giving praise to God. So the nativity here done by Giotto, who is the quintessential uh, painter of the Franciscan tradition, and we'll see later in his upper church, uh, this has left the stylized Byzantine uh, enclosed Madonna uh, iconographical which we saw in Byzantine art in our study of East and West. But we have a real Madonna sitting up and a real St. Joseph. These are real people in a real world that this fact is not just a theological truth, this is a physical reality. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, Emmanuel. So here we have the Christ wrapped in his linens, of course. Uh, theologically, he you know, comes wrapped in linens when he's born in a cave or stable, uh, or he's, or, and he's wrapped in linen when he goes out of this world in the cave uh, when he's dead. So here we have, I mean, the angels looking on. It's all very pious, but very human. The shepherds, I mean, the uh, body language of the shepherds looking up. They're not just, I mean, theological statements. The blue sky, it's a real night sky. It's not the golden iconographic stilo greco. Uh, the animals, of course, are in awe, even in the iconographical, but they're, they're, they're given a kind of humanity here, as we'll see later on, for, which was part of the Franciscan tradition of bringing live animals to the creche as the domesticated animals, the ox and the ass, are at the service of man. They're at the service at the redeemer of, to the redeemer of man. Next, please. Now, this is Duccio's version of the nativity also. Now, Duccio is the first painter, Sienese, uh, of the Trecento, uh, who was, we know was influenced by the new piety uh, of St. Francis. Now, even though this nativity is not as humanistic as the one by Giotto, what we see is we still, there's still this idea, well, it's a palette here, but it's a variation on the old cocoon theme, the, 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 the well enclosed, the, the source enclosed. But she's sitting there, and it is humanized. It's no longer just an archetype of the celestial vision. Again, it's this bringing of the theological message down to earth. If you, the, the face is not just an, a, a theological statement. It's a, a, it's a human being. Next, please. Now you see this also in the, in the beautiful Duccio uh, Madonnas of the Sienese School. These are in the, in the Sienese uh, Pinocoteca, beautiful uh, art gallery. But art is, of course, dedicated uh, in that time to a theological truth. We have here the Blessed Mother in her blue, pure dress, holy of honor, complete iconographically correct, the Christ child in his robes. It's stilo greco, golden background, the angels adoring. Uh, but there's a new tenderness, a new humanity, and this is this Franciscan spirit coming in, that the creation is good. And this is, again, as I say, Fran Francis is poetic. Uh, denial of this Manichaeanism that was coming into the church of saying the world is evil, created by an evil God. Next, please. Again, even in his uh, virgin enthroned Duccio in the Siena, uh, the Madonna, the body language is more humanized, it's more feminine, it's more serene. The Christ child also, next please, the face of the Madonna, the star of course, but there's a wistfulness, it's a, it's a very humanized version of the Byzantine prototype. The, wist, I mean the eyes, again, the big eyes, but they are human eyes. That you can almost see there's something going on inside of that very human head. Next, please. There's the Christ child, his two fingers blessing, as always. Wrap, he's in his robes. But there's something going on inside that head, too. This is a real child. He's still the divine wisdom, but he's, he's a child. The, somehow, Duccio here has given this wisdom concept that's uh, from the East. He's put it into the baby's head. This was, a, a, again, I believe, 
part of this Franciscan revolution of bringing things and making them real, that the people can't live on abstracts. They have to have a reality with which they can relate. Next, please. Even the angels are individual person. The curiosity kind of peeking around the corner in this adoration. Um, the, the hand kind of gripping, this kind of a tension in the hand. Uh, it, it's a very lovely sort of uh, kind of surprise. I mean, the, the mystery of the, uh, of the incarnation. I mean, and even the angels have got a peak. They, can, they can't just stand there as icons, as, 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 as part of a theological message. They're, he's put himself into the mystery here. The artist has put himself into, as we must put ourselves, into the mystery. We human beings have put ourselves, even as his angels, peek around the corner. Wow. Next, please. Uh, another of Duce's, again, this complete Byzantine archetype, but each time he's getting this wonderful, wistful expression. This is, I mean, the Hodogetria icon we saw from Constantinople, the Xilo Greco, but with the Christ child touching. And again, he's got a little baby. He's still the divine wisdom, but he's a bright baby. I mean, he's, uh, it's this uh, humanizing, and his robe is no longer the golden robe. It's almost a little nightdress. Next, please. The close-up of the face. Again, these wonderful, wistful eyes, the small mouth, the small nose, the Byzantine tradition, but the ideas going on inside. There's a real human being here. Mary is real. She's not just an archetype. Next. This is uh, <coughs> Simon Martini, again of the Sienese school. Uh, we know is under the influence of, of St. Francis and his spirituality. The, it's a different expression on the Madonna's face. It's again, the child is a real child, but very wide-eyed and awake. Uh, it's humanized. It's more of a real baby, as, as um, the artist would have seen a real baby wrapped up like that, with little fingers sticking out. And it's not as tender, perhaps, as Duccio, but it is, again, this wistful expression that there is a real Mary here, not just an archetype. Next, please. This is Martini's Annunciation. It's in a, this gilded uh, Stilo Greco uh, background. It's in ar a Gothic arches. But the, it's, not, again, not just the archetypal uh, presentation. The, there's a real relationship here. The angel is caught Mary in surprise. Uh, and she's turning on in her prayer, Woo! An angel has appeared. And the angel, he's not aggressive, but he is stating his case. He is um, saying something very real here. Again, this spirit of the artist putting himself into the scene not just, I mean, this is a theological vision that we must accept, but to put yourself there as the viewer must put yourself there, as we must put ourselves into these mysteries. They are real. They're not just ideas. Next, please. Uh, Lorenzetti's Annunciation, another man we know was under the influence of Francis. We have the angel. Iconography, always iconographically correct. These are Catholics, painting Catholic paintings. They're living in a Catholic world. It's just that this new vision, uh, this Franciscan vision, this poetic vision, has made it much more open and human and less stiff and formal. The, the angel is explaining in this case. He's not just saying, he's kind of explaining. The artist is trying to find what, what really happened there. What really happened? And to try to come to grips with this in your archetypal painting. Next, please. Now we're going to move to the upper church here. This is the Basilica at, at Assisi. It's an Italian combination of Romanesque and Gothic at the, at the time, the bell tower. And there are two churches. The lower church, which the door opening out on the parking lot, is uh, at exact right angles to the upper church. And it's in the lower church, of course, the crypt. This is where St. Francis is, is buried below that. And the upper church, which we're going to see next, uh, is decorated with the life of St. Francis. It, these are beautiful scenes from his life, taken from the official biography of St. Bonaventure. And some people have argued, I mean, that these paintings were not done by Giotto. It doesn't really matter whether they were or not. But, I mean, it was from the time they were painted until 
this 18th century, but more normally considered in the 19th century, German criticism came in of the styles of, it wasn't really the styles, it's the criticism of the Bible. I mean, they said, they started criticizing the Word of God, they're criticizing this, what did it, is it really painted by Giotto? Well, it doesn't really matter to us. The archives were lost, I mean, in, in, in one of the battles of, uh, of Assisi, but it is the Franciscan style and the Franciscans at Assisi, I was there, I mean, do promote this as being by Giotto. So we will take it for granted that they are by Giotto. Let's move on, please. Next, please. Now they start at the right of the altar, stage right, and they go around. There are 28 of these. They come all the way around the nave of the church here, and you will live this life of St. Francis as you walk around. They're enormous. They're very big, as you saw in, in, that, in that first shot in there. And it's an overwhelming experience uh, when you walk into this church because you are overpowered by the life of St. Francis. In today's churches, we have one or two statues here or a little picture there. In these churches, built at the time of Francis, your senses, as in the Gothic also, through the glass, but in the, the, the pictures are impressing themselves on your eyes, just, I mean, as your experiences the divine liturgy in this Mass, you are, you're, all your senses are being filled. You are being edified through all your senses. Next, please. Now, the first of the, uh, one of the first, I'm not going to do all 28, but uh, just to give an idea of how they are painted, whether they're by Giotto or not, and I believe they are, this is uh, St. Francis giving his cloak to the impoverished knight. Now, St. Francis was not a saint at this time. He still wanted to be a knight himself, but he was well aware of the social distinctions of his time, and for him, out of a, a human nobility, human virtue, to see somebody on a higher station, impoverished, led him to an act of charity to give his cloak that he was going to take off to the, to the wars uh, to this impoverished knight. And it's, it's, as grace builds on nature, this human act, there was a... God could build further on this to, to build up, up his sanctity. It's very uh, distinct from today where people see people of a higher station perhaps and they don't say, well, I'm sorry he's come down. Uh, well, I'm glad he's come down, now I can get up. No, the, the, this act of generosity, there's no jealousy or envy here. A naturally, so science was a naturally noble soul. Next, please. This is, of course, the vision before the uh, crucifix in St. Damien's, the talking crucifix, where he finally is called by Christ to be not just a knight uh, to fight against the heathen, but I mean, a, a knight of, of, of Christ fighting against, I mean, the world of rebuilding, uh, a member of the church militant. Now, the thing that makes this, I mean, Giotesque or Franciscan is that it's this is the real world. These are pictures of a saint from the here and now. They're not pictures of an event that happened 2,000 years ago. They're not the uh, celestial visions of the Byzantine church. And there's nothing wrong with those. We'll discuss this later, how these must be harmonized. But they are the real. The, the sky is a blue sky. These are real buildings. Uh, you can see that the, it is actually falling apart. It's not a uh, metaphoric extrapolation of the mystery of Francis's conversion. It's a depiction of the very conversion itself. Next, please. Here we have Saint Fran the vision of the Pope. He went to uh, get his, the order, as we all know, I mean, uh, established under the Pope, because Francis was, of course, uh, totally obedient. So he asked for the Pope's uh, benediction on the new order, which was very radically different, but. Uh, and the Pope had a dream that night. He wasn't impressed at all with St. Francis. He had a dream of St. Francis holding up the Lateran Basilica, which is painted here and very much in real life, trying to make it a physically real thing for the uh, onlooker to behold. And it's the Lateran Basilica, not St. Peter's, because at that time the Lateran was the seat of uh, the Roman Catholic popes. Uh, this was their home. The uh, Cala Sancta, the Holy Stairs, are in the Lateran, which you may still visit. The Sancta Sanctorum, the holiest of uh, all the shrines of Catholicism, is the head of those chair stairs in the uh, Lateran Basilica, which only the Pope may enter. We are not, we, nobody else is allowed in there. The, the Jerusalem 
ended, Rome began. That Rome is the New Jerusalem. And this was all in the Lateran at that time. So he has that St. Francis, by holding up the Lateran Basilica, is not just holding up a specific church, as he was not just rebuilding a specific church of St. Damien, he is holding up the Church of Christ. Next, please. The vision of Ezekiel. Uh, again, it's not a heavenly vision. It's trying to make this a real thing so that real people, real Italians of that time, could identify with it. And here are very normal people painted by Giotto with real sort of normal positions. So sort of looking, hey, look, at, look up in the air, and there goes the saint and in a very real setting, trying to make this as authentic as he possibly could. Next, please. A casting out of the demons from Arezzo. Uh, we know that St. Francis from St. Bonaventure's uh, biography was traveling by the city of Arezzo, was having tremendous civil strife, and Francis doing, didn't do it himself. Francis, always being a very humble man, said to, so to, his, to his companion, uh, Brother Sylvester, would you just go and please ask those demons to leave? Because he saw above this causing all of this strife, as always, there are demonic influences. So the devils, Francis could see these devils as he was a man of spiritual insight. He saw behind these civil strife the actual presence of evil spirits. So, I mean, Sylvester, whether he saw them or not, went over there and bid them be gone, and they were gone, and peace was restored, harmony was restored to the town of Arezzo. A very, trying to get the idea of a real uh, Italian city that an Italian of that time could identify with. Next, please. Here we have the death... Uh, oh, this is, of course, the, the crash at uh, Greccio, uh, I think this is, again, key to this whole uh, new uh, Franciscan spirituality. The crash, the, the, that we are no longer allowed to put in our public spaces, uh, this was invented by Francis. He would get life-size figures and real animals, and this is in Gretsch, it's, it's in, inside the village here. It probably, in, in, in the biographies, it was outside the village. But the idea is it's bringing this theological event down from heaven to the village square where we can no longer celebrate, I mean, this, this wonderful Christmas mystery, that it is Emmanuel, it is not just the passion, d death, and resurrection, and ascension of our Lord, which is of importance, that it is, Christ is with us in the here and now. We are going to work out our salvation here. We're going to love Jesus now, in the sacraments, in each other, in our veneration of the statues, I mean, and seeing this. Now, the, of course, the story is that when Francis picked up the statue of the little baby uh, Christ child, that uh, the lo one at least of the local inhabitants saw the Christ child come alive and smile at St. Francis. Well, the skeptics will say this is pious legend, but uh, well, ask him when you see him. I'm sure it happened. Next, please. The, the best known of all the stories of St. Francis, and very typical of Giotto, by the way, is the preaching to the birds. Uh, now that I've heard your lovely chatter, allow me to speak, uh, St. Francis tells the birds, that even the birds singing gives praise to God. I mean, we, think we see Saint pa mm, statues of St. Francis, there's bird baths all around, and there's nothing wrong with this, it's a wonderful devotion, that Francis knew that all nature sings God's praise. And then he preached to the birds, and according to his companions, who were obviously astonished, the birds stopped and listened. It happened. Uh, I think the painter, Giotto here, puts it in a totally natural s setting with real types of trees. The birds are quite real. And Francis is very intent. His body language shows us that he's not just, I mean, uh, an idea of somebody preaching to work. He, Giotto has tried to show us the saint bending over very carefully, very attentively, talking to the birds. And his companion who's rather stiff, is the, body, is the opposite. He's not bending forward. He's leaning back with his hand up. He says, oh my, what is going on here? Next, please. Uh, this is the Knight of uh, Celano, that natural virtue is repaid with supernatural grace. That this man uh, invited Francis to dinner, Francis and his companions to dinner, and Francis was given a vision at the time of the impending death of this man who had in his kindness been, uh, had offered Francis his home and his table. And Francis, in turn, 
had uh, his confession heard and the sacraments were given to him so that he might go to heaven. So again, it's this natural and supernatural tied together. Natural virtue will bring about, through God's grace, a supernatural conversion. And in this case, it was through the vision of St. Francis. The consternation of the people over here is, is wonderful. These are you know, individual people. Again, uh, Giotto is trying to make this a very real event so that real people will be able to identify with it, that there is a sense of sort of a common horror here I mean, the, at what's going on. The, the guide collapsed at dinner. Next, please. Uh, this is St. Francis before uh, Pope Honorius. Uh, and it's an analogy to, I think, our Lord as a child, 12 years old, in the temple. Because here are, is the Pope surrounded by all his learned doctors and theologians, listening to the poverello, the man that has no, I mean, theological education, so to speak, except through divine inspiration, uh, preaching, and they were all utterly astounded by his wisdom as the scribes and Pharisees were astounded by the wisdom of our Lord in the temple. And this is depicted here again beautifully by Giotto with the body language of the Pope. And the Pope is absolutely raptured and intent on what Francis is saying. And Francis is just very energetically explaining the things the way he sees them, the way that God has shown him. Next, please. Uh, another great uh, moment in the life of St. Francis, painted by Giotto in the upper church here, is the receiving of the stigmata uh, on Monte Averno, um, where the seraph, Christ as a seraph, with the wings of the seraph covering as Ezekiel had seen, uh, imprinted upon Francis' own body his own wound, wounds. This total identification of St. Francis with his crucified Lord, that Francis was in absolute sync, as we would say, with what our Lord wanted done on this earth at a specific time. And to make this bond more perfect, Christ allowed St. Francis, not as some sort of sign or badge of honor, but to be allowed to suffer the same wounds that he had suffered on the cross at Calvary. And these are not, I mean, just little symbols. Those are real wounds on Francis's hands, and they really hurt. Next, please. Uh, the death of St. Francis, I'm going to uh, have here, where his soul, I mean, is taken up to God. And as I say, he was uh, canonized within, I mean, two years of his death. Um, surrounding all of the Franciscans around, and the whole church mourned at this moment of the passing of one of the greatest human beings who had walked the face of this earth. Next, please. Now, stopping Francis here for a moment, I'm going to continue with Giotto because this is the sacred in art, and we'll get back to St. Francis uh, with Giotto in a moment, but the best known of Giotto's, the most identifiable artist with this Franciscan spirit, is the Arena Chapel, uh, where the life of the Blessed Mother and the life of Jesus is uh, laid out. And that on the left wall, next please, that's just the other wall, the right wall, that these two walls of the life of Jesus and the life of the Blessed Mother, always in Catholic theology, the, the two are combined. Mary and Jesus are intimately connected. She is the mother of, of God. She is the one who said yes. Uh, next, please. At the end of the Arena Chapel, we find the uh, last judgment, because all Christian art is based on this, that we are going to work our way through this life on earth to this heavenly moment when we will be hopefully be counted among the elect. Next, please. Uh, from these chapel paintings, we are just to show the intimacy, this is Anna and Joachim from the life of the Virgin, this tremendous tenderness, human tenderness of the, uh, the husband and wife embracing. Next, please. The adoration of the Magi, the kings coming to adore the Christ child. Even the camel is astonished at the 
birth of our Lord. All nature is in awe of this coming of Emmanuel. Next, please. Uh, the slaughter of the innocents, how Giotto has captured the anguish, the real anguish of the people at this terrible event. Next, please. Uh, one of the guards at the tomb uh, from the resurrection, you can almost hear him snore. Next, please. And the angel folding back the sky, and here we have Sister Moon giving praise. Next, please. Another of the great works of Giotto, we'll see, is from the Santa Croce Chapel in Florence. The two tombs of the Bardi family and the Peruzzi family are in this chapel. The Bardi is closest to the altar and the Peruzzi to the uh, further out. Next, please. Uh, here we see St. Francis again appearing to the brother at Arles. France, uh, Giotto painted these in full uh, command. He's about 50 years old when he painted these, so in full command of his uh, artistic faculties. And still this uh, Franciscan uh, spirituality is, is prevalent in the spirituality of the Italian people at that time. Uh, so in the tomb of the Bardi here we have Francis appearing. There was a dispute among the brothers uh, uh, at this time in France, and during the and Saint Francis himself came there and resolved the argument. Next, please. A wonderful painting by Giotto of the uh, when Saint Francis went to visit the Sultan. He went uh, and tried to convince the Sultan to become a Christian, and the Sultan, well, he said, "If uh, why don't you have one of your uh, Mohammedan." Uh, priests or imams walk through the fire and I'll walk through the fire and whoever comes out on the other side wins. Next please. Well this is the reaction of the imam I mean, in Giotto's painting. I mean he's not up for it at all and Giotto has captured this wonderful sort of horror on the, uh, the Muslim imam's face here. Next please. Uh, the Peruzzi chapel has the scenes from St. John and the, this is the rising of the Drusina. Saint, uh, next, please. Oh, here's the uh, scene here. And it's a wonderful scene of this dynamic action of St. John the, raising the uh, fallen widow here. Next, please. The strength of this character, even though the face has been obliterated somewhat because it's done in fresco and it's uh, deteriorated and the gesture of the hand. Next please. I'd just like to go on and say that the Franciscan tra tra tradition went on through into the artists that followed in the Quattrocento. Masaccio for example in the expulsion from the Garden of Eden is putting yourself there at the time. Next please. The, the expressions on the faces, I mean, exp the horror of original sin. Next, please. Uh, Masaccio again, uh, St. Anne, the Virgin, and the Christ Child. The traditional Catholic images as you are there. Next, please. Next, please. Again, Masaccio, these tremendously human pictures of real people and real events. Next, please. The Annunciation, again, according to the, by Piero della Francesca, one of the last of these great artists of the Quattrocento, the iconography is the same as we have seen throughout, except God has come into the world. We see him here. He has come in from his upper stage right corner, and he is bringing the good news. Now, to terminate this uh, thing here, I think this picture shows, and I hope exemplifies, this wonderful transition we saw brought about by the poet St. Francis of taking the celestial vision of God in heaven and bringing it down and giving us the exemplar here on earth that we might follow. We will be uh, going on in our next um, talk, as I mentioned, St. Dominic. Uh, we will be taking uh, his influence on Christianity and we will look at the life of one of the great uh, saints, as I said before, um, of the order and his vision. Thank you very much.